All right, congratulations. You guys have made it to the end. Uh, chapter 11, we are going to go over chapter 11, current liabilities and payroll accounting. Um, our focus is going to be primarily on <clears throat> the payroll part. I mean, it's going to probably be 50-50, actually. I don't know why I say primarily, but we are, we are going to work on both of them. Um, let's talk about liabilities and their characteristics. We're going to be focusing mostly on current liabilities in this chapter. We will discuss shortly, shortly a, a little bit about long-term liabilities. But our focus is current liabilities because long-term liabilities, notes payable, uh, installment notes, bonds, stuff like that are going to be talked about in Accounting 112 in Chapter 14 or 15? 14. 14. <clears throat> so anyway, here we go. So what is a liability? It is a past transaction that gives a company a present obligation for future payment or assets or services or something. It's going to, something's going to happen in the future that we have to uh, do or provide for. We have two different types of liabilities, just like assets. We have current and we have long-term. Current liabilities are due within one year of the operating cycle of the company. Long-term are due after a, uh, the operating cycle of the company. Now, long-term liabilities have a current portion of that long-term liabilities. So if you think about car loans, how, home loans, if you have a home loan or a car loan in, in January 1st, you're going to have payments throughout the entire year for that home or a car. That's the current portion of this long-term debt that you have a car loan for three, five, seven years or a home loan for 15, 30, 40, God help you if you have an 80 year loan. Uh, they're, they're coming up with some seriously stupid long loans, guys. Um, I don't know what to tell you because I would never get into a 40 year home loan. I would never get in anything higher than a 30 year and even a 30 year, I'm gonna try and pay that sucker off as fast as I can. Um, and I'm certainly not gonna get into a 10 year, nine year, eight year, God help you, even a seven year car loan. That car is gonna be trashed by the end of that period. So try not to get those. I mean, I know sometimes you got to do what you got to do, but man, if you can avoid those, that would be great. Uh, here's a breakout of some of the companies that are out there and their current long-term liabilities. So of their liabilities, uh, this does not tell us whether these percentages are short-term or long-term. So I guess it's just a pretty slide. <clears throat> you can have some uncertainties with liabilities. For example, you may not know who you're going to pay. You may not know when you're going to pay it, and you may not know how much you're going to pay it, and you still have to record a liability. Brian, you say, well, how in the world can we not know how much to pay a person if we are going to still record a liability? Well, let's discuss. All right, what happens for known current liabilities? Again, we're going to focus on current liabilities for the most part. We have the known ones. Accounts payable is the big one, and I know everybody loves to just try and shove everything into accounts payable. However, that is not appropriate. However, accounts payable is something we deal with on a regular basis because it involves our suppliers. It is what we owe the people we buy merchandise from or we use their services to help our business work the way it needs to work. That is an accounts payable. Sales taxes or sales tax payable is what it should say because we can have a sales tax expense, although it's rare uh, with a company because most of the time we roll that into our inventory or whatever else. But a sale, an accounts or uh, sales tax Payable is we collect money on behalf of the state or whatever city entity, whatever. <clears throat> That's not our money, though we collected the cash. We have to remit that to the state or another entity, and so we will do so. So that is a liability, sales tax payable. Unearned revenues we've touched on is revenues we've received but have yet to earn them. Money we, I should say, not revenues we've earned or received. Money we've received but haven't earned yet. Someone gives us money for us to do a service later on down the road. Um, you go to a concert. I, I think that's one of the slides here. You go to a concert, you pay uh, 50 bucks to go to that concert. And then um, until you, that concert's performed, that individual group or organization cannot record that as a revenue until they made the performance. If you think about COVID time period, a lot of shows were canceled. Well, they don't just get to keep the money. They did not provide the service, so they have to send the money back or in my case, when I was, uh, I did football tickets to the um, <clears throat> Fiesta Bowl and the, and the, and the uh, whatever Motel 6 Bowl it's called now. I don't even know. <clears throat> whatever it's called now. Uh, they, they gave me options. I could either roll it over to the next year. I could, um, I could donate it, which, no, I'm going to roll it over. I rolled it over. Or I could get a refund. I rolled it over. 
It was no big deal. It was already spent. I just didn't want to do that. Um, notes payable. Again, uh, notes payable can be short term, uh, especially if they're you know due within 90 days. You can have a note payable 90 days. Payroll obligations are mostly uh, short term because their they're, uh, salary is payable, wages payable, things like that. Employees want to get paid you know, every two weeks, uh, twice a month at worst. Uh, God forbid if it's a one month thing. And uh, if you pay me once time a year, uh, I don't think I want to work for you. <laughs> so multi-period known liabilities, other ones like that. So let's go through some of these. Sales taxes payable is really easy. You sell a certain amount. You, you have a percentage associated with the sales. Uh, you're going to multiply the sales by that percentage. And that's the amount of tax you're going to collect. The customer pays $6,300, you collect $6,000 in sales, and you collect $300 in sales tax payable. When you pay it, you're going to debit the, um, oh, it doesn't say it, so we jumped on to the unearned revenues. When you pay this to the state, you're going to debit your sales tax payable and credit cash. You're done. It's just a way that uh, you have to be that intermittent for the state in order to do transactions. Unearned revenues. Selena Gomez sells nine hundred thousand dollars in tickets for three concerts. Average amount nine hundred thousand dollars each. Although we know that's not really the case, okay. But when we do one of the performances on October thirty first, she's out there doing a Halloween concert, which y'all better be out trick or treating, uh, not not going to concerts. We do something scary and spooky, right? Anyway, um, you're, she's gonna. Well, when she first gets the money, she's gonna debit cash and credit unearned revenue, unearned ticket revenue. And then when she does this first concert, because each of them is 300000 because they literally had just enough people for each concert to collect only $300,000 for each one, exactly, right down to the penny. No, it's going to be different. Some, some concerts are going to be more or less. Uh, ticket revenue, uh, they're going to move it from unearned revenue to revenue to earned revenue uh, by the amount that it is. So in this case, they just cut it in thirds, 300000 <clears throat> entries to account for short-term notes payable. All right, so we have uh, various situations that that could occur. Uh, we may have the promise to pay a specified amount on a future stated date within the year, um, interest on it, and, and other things. So let's move on. So on August 23rd, Brady Company asked McGraw to accept $100 cash in a 60-day 12% $500 note to replace its existing $600 account payable. This is not uncommon. So we're going to debit our accounts payable by $600 because we're going to say, hey, we're done with that. We got $100 cash, and they're going to finance a $500 note payable to, I'm sorry, I'm looking at it from McGraw-Hill's company. Brady, Brady um, is going to, we're, we are Brady. We are going to pay $500 as a note payable. Okay, so we owe that money now. We're getting rid of the accounts payable. We paid out a cash $100. So now, um, on October 22nd, when we go to pay this, we got to pay the $500 plus the interest, $500 times 12% times the 60 over 360. Remember, every percentage is giving us an annual percentage rate. We got to break it down to uh, the amount, the time period in which that was uh, that was outstanding. So in this case, uh, we're dividing 60, 300, we're dividing 60 by 360, multiplying that by 12% by $500 to get us $10. We're paying $10 in interest, so we're paying the company 510 bucks. Uh, if we borrow from the bank, $2,000, this is basically the same thing again, guys, uh, exactly the same. It's just a matter of, this is just a note payable. It wasn't an, uh, accounts payable first. So when we got the loan cash debit, 200,000 notes payable, 2000, we may do this because we may need to cover, uh, payroll because we're in a slump, um, part of the operating cycle, you know, Christmas, December, those times tend to be a high spending time period. And so for people to get through the summer, sometimes we'll take out loans and then they'll pay it off at the end of that. So instead of like what they should do is maintain a working capital that would prevent from the have to pay that interest. But, you know, who am I? Just a, you know, counting period guy. Uh, when notes extend over two accounting periods, remember you have an adjusting entry in that middle period to record what's been accrued for that interest payable to that point, And then you finish paying it off at the maturity date. In this case, they borrowed money on December 16th. This sounds familiar. And then on, on the Day of Love or Arizona Statehood Day, uh, the company pays it. But we accrued $10 interest on December 31st, uh, taking the 2,000 times 12% times the 15 divided by 360. 
to fulfill the 60 day note, we're going to calculate on the date of payment or the maturity date, the 2000 times 12% times the remaining number of days we didn't accrue that interest, 45 divided by 360. So we're going to have interest expense of $30. Uh, interest payable, we're going to reduce because we show we owed it in the prior financial statements. And then we're going to reduce the notes payable by 2000. We're going to pay the full amount of 2040. Compute and record employee payroll deductions and liabilities. Okay, this is kind of the big meat and potatoes of this chapter. Nothing to stress or worry about. It's totally doable. But bottom line is, is you're going to learn here that when they hire you, when someone hires you and offers you benefits, it's a lot more payment than you guys are maybe aware of, okay? First, we're going to look at employees and how they have payroll deductions from their check. And then we're going to look at also the payments that the employer has to make based on the agreements with the government in order to have jobs or to provide work or whatever. Use the on. Employee payroll deductions. You start off with your gross pay. That's when you take your rate of pay and you multiply it by the number of hours you worked. That's if you're a wage employee, if you're a salary pay, it's the what, what you negotiated on an annual basis divided by the number of accounting or, or paycheck periods that you have. Then... You have certain fees and or payments and stuff you have to pay whether you like it or not. First of all, you got to pay into Social Security. That's FICA taxes, Social Security, and Medicare. Whether you like it or not, it's going to be withheld. Um, state and local income taxes. I love that they put California on here because they're one of the highest tax states in the entire country. Uh, I think just short of New York and maybe... Shoot, what was that other one? Anyway, there's another one, but they're pretty heavily taxed. I like that they put California in there. You can put New York there too. Um, and then you have your federal income tax. So you have your state and federal income taxes withheld as well. Then you have voluntary deductions. Okay, some of these voluntary deductions may be your health insurance or dental insurance or uh, it could be anything. Um, anything that basically you say, hey, also take this out because I want this. And then everything deduct, all of those subtracted from your gross pay is your net pay. It's what you actually see hit your bank account which can be depressing at times. I remember my first paycheck out of college. I almost cried. I was not with joy. All right, we're basing, in this book, we're basing our FICA taxes off of the 2020 years. Keep in mind, these things change, all right? Since I've been teaching alone, the ceiling on the Social Security taxes have increased. I mean, it was at like 120. 4,000, I think at first. And so we're already at 137.7. So it just, it, it's going to keep rising. You got to factor in that people's earning power is, is reduced due to inflation. And so people are, you know, they need to raise the ceiling to keep up with, with uh, inflation. But as of 2020, we're going to have 6.2% of the first $1,137,700 earned taxed at social security. So the next dollar after 137700 you make will not be taxed at all on Social Security. Then FICA taxes for Medicare is 1.45%, no matter how much money you make. All that's going to go into the um, Social Security coffers, okay? Because federal and so many different taxes. But for examples of some voluntary deductions, charitable giving, medical, life insurance premiums, pensions, contributions, unions, dues. Although there's a debate as to whether union dues are really a voluntary thing. Either way, you can have any of these things deducted and sent or done to your paycheck, etc. And those amounts will be given as well. So here's an example of what an employee, uh, or excuse me, a journal entry would look for a salary's expense. So our first journal entry is going to be salary's expense for the full amount of all of the things that we got to do. We have the Social Security FICA, so those are going to be payables, and we're going to have to submit those to the FICA organization, Department of Revenue. Then we're going to have federal income tax. We're sending that to the Department of Revenue too. I, I said Department of Revenue, IRS. Arizona state income taxes goes to the Department of Revenue, Arizona Department of Revenue. Medical insurance payable will be sent to whatever organization, MetLife, 
or no, they're not medical. No, are they medical? Are they dental? I know, and life insurance. They may be medical. Blue Cross Blue Shield, Aetna, you know, whoever else. Uh, union dues payable, all these things. They're payable because they're a liability that comes out of the employee check and has to get remitted to these organizations. Then you have salaries payable. That's your net amount. Out of the $2,000, you're only getting $1,500 and $24 extra. Then to make the payment, you're going to debit your salaries payable for the amount you're paying and then cash for $1,524. When you remit these amounts to these organizations, you will debit those organizational payables and credit cash. Same thing, just different time period. All right, so how do we calculate this? How do we compute this, all right? We have the percentages of your FICA Social Security and FICA Meditech. This has already been done for the employee side. Now we're looking at the employer side. Since you've already calculated this, don't reinvent the wheel. Just take the amount you did before and apply it here. The only thing you're gonna have to worry about is your federal and state unemployment tax. Now, federal unemployment tax takes 6% of the first $7,000 of wages. Anything after that, they don't charge you for unemployment tax. A credit is given for any SUDA up to 5.4%, okay? And therefore, basically federal unemployment is 0.6%, and state unemployment would be 5.4%, all of which is only taxed on the first 7,000 of an employee's wages. The employee does not pay this. This is only the employer. So they match your FICA and then pay this unemployment tax. And in many respects, they also pay a lot of your um, medical part of the premiums there, dental, other things, uh, life insurance. They also will chip in for benefits to keep and retain employees in that respect. Um, and so looking at it from the employer side, when we look at the journal entry, it's going to be a smaller journal entry, but a journal entry is going to be a little bit bigger. Nonetheless, payroll taxes, uh, is going to be just the total amount of these. And they're going to be added up as we calculate them. We're going to plug in our FICA taxes, Medicare and social security, because we've already calculated them on the one for the employee. And we're just going to take the federal and state. We're going to take the federal we take the first $2,000 because that's what we made this last paycheck. Remember on the one we did before, multiply that by 5.4% to get 108, 2,000 times 0.6% or 0 0.006 to get the uh, $12 on the FUDA. Remember FUDA and SUDA stand for Social, uh, State Unemployment Tax Authority or Tax Act. FUDA is Federal Unemployment Tax Authority or Tax Act. I don't care if I totally screwed up. If it's actor authority, I really don't even care. It's just food and suited to me. It's all it's ever been. All right. <clears throat> so those are the things we need to be aware of as far as our short term. Journal entry is pretty straightforward. Internal controls of payroll is very important. Okay. You, you, the employee hiring process must be handled by one organization, one organization only. Okay. Uh, it should not be human resources. Everyone's saying, well, I, don't they do everything? No, they they should not be in the hiring process except for maybe posting the job and that's it okay they should not be involved otherwise it should be another group of people outside the hr office and this is why because the hr office tends or should in many respects will enter the new employee into the information system they will set their pay rate they will set all of that information and so they should not be able to be part of the employee hiring because then they could say, oh, we hired this person, ghost employee. And then nobody knows, this check's getting cut, and no one even knows who this person is, right? Payroll preparation. Okay, this needs to be done probably by the accounting department. Payroll preparation. Oh, wait, payroll preparation. No, this is where they're entering all the information. So this is the HR. HR, they, pr they put the employee in the system and put all the stuff they need to in there. That's, that's what it is. Timekeeping needs to be done by their direct supervisors, all of their records, and, and that's the only person. They should be checking it. The employee should be signing the time card, and the manager should be signing the time card. Submitting that then to the accounting department who handles the payroll payment. They're going to take the number of hours verified by the, the boss and the employee and entering the hours into the system and outcomes be based on the percentage or the pay rate that payroll did, and out comes the amount and payroll pays it and then very different than all this you're going to have an internal audit group who should be going in and checking every one of these they have no authority to create anything new in there 
They should only be able to verify that all the information from the hiring to the payment was accurate. I love internal controls over payroll. It is so easy to look for those. And it is ironically one of the worst areas that people tend to have problems in. It's just unbelievable. Multi-period known liabilities, you got your unearned revenues, your notes payable. Basically, they can expand beyond typical times. Okay, now we're going to change gears a little bit and talk about um, <clears throat> estimated liabilities, warranties, and bonuses. I'm focusing on warranties, okay? I'm not necessarily worried too much about bonuses, but we'll go over both. All right, so uh, estimated liabilities, there's a known obligation. We don't know how much, but we can reasonably es estimate how much that's going to be. That's what we're doing here, okay? Pensions, healthcare, vacation pay, and warranties, okay? Here we go. Uh, here we go. We got employer expenses for pensions or medical, dental, life, and disability insurance. Uh, we assume an employer agrees to pay an amount for medical insurance equal to 8000 and contribute an additional 10% of the employee's $120,000 gross salary to retirement program. Bang. I want to work for them. Actually, I do. Um, state of Arizona. But they, they, we pull out 10%. They, they do 10%. That's another one. that It's a lot of money. But all right. So... We have a $20,000 in employees' benefits. We're basically just taking that $8,000 of medical insurance payable and $120,000, excuse, excuse me, $12,000 to the uh, retirement program. It's just simple that. Vacation benefits. This is kind of a tough one because if you have a crude amount of hours that you don't use and then your rate of pay changes, you have to make adjustments for these vacation benefits. But we are gonna expense them in the year they were earned. And uh, we're just gonna, at the end of each accounting period, we have to adjust these based on the rate of pay if they've changed. But when they do take vacation, then we're gonna have the vacation benefits payable and credit cash. So that's why when you, if you work for a company that, that kind of delineates a lot of this, you're gonna see on your, on your pay stub, you know, normal pay, and then there's like vacation pay or personal day pay or holiday pay. Because those things are, are liabilities tracked and are now reducing those balances and expensing them. All we see on the employee side is, hey, I got my paycheck. That's all I care about, right? But on the accounting side, we got to track all those. Uh, bonuses, if, um, if we know that we're going to have a certain amount of money, we're going to set aside for bonuses based on whatever. When The minute we know that, we're going to go ahead and employee bonus expense it and credit bonus payable. When we go to pay it out to whomever's going to get it, we're going to debit the bonus payable and credit cash. Warranties is a big one because they're everywhere. You get two different kinds of versions of warranties. You have the non-paid into liability where you go and they say, hey, we're some happens this thing in 60 days, you know, parts, repairs, everything, we're going to take care of you. <clears throat> then you have the Walmarts and the Costco's and the Amazons all trying to sell you the, the paid warranty. Hey, you can pay into this and you can have an extended warranty. We're only focused on the one that they're paying, uh, that they're not paying for, that they just get based on the fact that we don't want a lemon. We don't want to buy a TV and we plug it in, it doesn't work, and they ain't gonna do anything for us. We're gonna look at a car situation here where a car, $16,000, has a minimum of one year or $12,000 mile warranty covering. For, you know, they, they call it all differently. You know, I don't know if you've been to a dealership in a while, but bumper to bumper, powertrain warranty, you know, anything happens, you know, whatever. So when we make the sale, they're estimating about 4% of the car's selling price. This sounds very familiar if you remember chapter nine, the um, percentage of sales method on the account receivable, on the, uh, excuse me, on the um, bad debt expense. Same concept here. We're just taking the sale price and multiplying it by a percentage we think we're gonna have to cover to fix a car. Now that doesn't mean, what this really is, <clears throat> is they say, we, we, we produce 200,000 cars. And we think of these 200,000 cars, we're going to have five of them go bad. And we think it's, we're going to have to spend about $3,000 per car to do that. So if we average that out to all the cars, we're going to estimate that about 4% of the selling price of the cars at current uh, situation is going to be needing warranty work. So we're going to debit our warranty expense. We're going to credit our warranty liability by the result of the $16,000 for the car multiplied by the percent we think might be needed for each car on average. So we get the $640, we're gonna throw it in there. This example only gives us an example of a, rep a repair and how we're gonna pull it out of auto parts inventory. 
But we also need to consider too that we have labor that's going to be applied to the warranty work as well. In this case, we see that we're going to debit our warranty liability and reduce it by the amount of the auto parts we pulled from inventory to fix it. But we'll also do uh, a lot of times the the um, dealerships and companies are going to have people who are dedicated solely to warranty work. And so part of or all of their wages are just going to come out of this warranty uh, <clears throat> expense or excuse me, this warranty liability. Uh, for those that don't, people are going to have to track their their um, pay hours. I had to do this as an auditor. I had to track my hours for each audit I was working on. And that's how I turned my timesheet in because we had to track our hours. That's what uh, auto mechanics would have to do if they worked in the warranty and in other places, uh, they would have to uh, annotate how much work they did in each of those areas. So, all right, now we're going to talk about contingent, um, how to account for contingent liability. All right, so contingent liabilities are things that we don't exactly know what's going to be happening per se. But we have to think about the possibility that it could happen. A lot of this tends to revolve around lawsuits um, or things that, you know, that are being litigated is, is kind of what happens in this situation. So contingent liability, if, the, if it's remote that it could happen, uh, you know, like we, we're like totally confident this thing's not going to go bad. Uh, we don't have to do anything. So basically, there really isn't a liability at that point if the, if the possibility of it is remote. If it's possible, we got to disclose it in the notes, but we don't record an actual amount. If it's probable, then we have to uh, ascertain whether or not we can estimate it reasonably or not. If we can estimate it, we need to record it as a liability. Debit our estimated liability expense or estimated expense and credit the estimated liability. If it's something that we can't estimate, we're going to put in our disclose in our notes. Now, here's the kicker. If you know you can estimate it, but you don't want to disclose it as a financial liability and you put it as, a not, as, as non-estimatable and you put it in the note, uh, you get in trouble. So don't do it. Don't do it. Uh, here, here's some examples of some of those. I'll let you look at those. You can pause them. I'm not going to go into these a whole lot. All right, here's a couple ratios to throw at you. The final ones, the times interest earned ratio. Uh, income before interest expense and income taxes divided by interest expense. It's basically how many times, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, regarding your interest rate, how many times uh, you should be able to get it based off of your income. Um, you want to be able to have a positive return on that and everything. So uh, here's examples of times interest earned. Um, so for Diego, it's 2.5 times. Basically, the interest expense that they're giving um, is 2.5 times, or their revenue is 2.5 times the amount of uh, income or interest expense they're paying. Um, I am not going to go through this specific payroll report stuff um, and account for corporate income taxes. So that is the end of Chapter 11. You guys did awesome. Hey, if you have any questions, let's get, a, get together and chat about it. Otherwise, you guys have a good one. And your final number, word for um, this semester is updog, U-P-D-O-G, U-P-D-O-G, one word, updog, umbrella, papa, delta, Oscar, golf, U-P-D-O-G, as in use it in a sentence. Uh, man, it stinks in here. It smells like up dog. What is up dog? Nothing. What is up with you? <laughs> uh, reference to the office. I love the office. Anyway, have a good one. You guys, we will see you guys hopefully in accounting 112. If not though, I wish you the very best of luck. If so, Hey, I look forward to having you again in accounting 112.